All right, um, hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. It's uh, pretty weird being on the other side. I've been coming to Civic Tech for almost four years now. So it's uh, weird, but grateful to be presenting to all of you. Um, the project that I'm working on, uh, it's called It's Nearby. I'll get to more into why it's called that. Um, but just want to say like this project and just sort of how it sort of started was basically coming from Civic Tech. Um, so this project wouldn't really exist and wouldn't be continuing unless, uh, you know, communities like this existed. So hopefully from this and uh, project that you see in Come and Go, uh, I'll inspire you to sort of work on or help uh, other civic tech projects that you'll see. Um, for this one, um, the focus for It's Nearby is uh, started off as a parks project, trying to map out and showcase different product, parks around the city. Um, sort of exploring different data sets and hearing different ideas from, from people. Uh, it sort of expanded to a, a community slash project, trying to map out different things across the city. So in short, it's a, a parks and community project. And where it sort of got its roots from was a previous project that used to map out archival or historical information. Um, so sort of when thinking about how to put that into an idea or a phrase, um, I sort of thought about the phrase, history is all around us, it's nearby. So that's where the name It's Nearby comes from. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a Toronto resident, born and raised in Scarborough. I uh, currently work for the Ministry of Labor as a data analyst, um, but sort of on the side, I also like to do photography and try to intersect uh, data and photography projects. Um, specifically with this project, uh, what it's based on is sort of an older project from 2018 called Old TO. Um, some of you may have remembered it. Uh, they actually did a, a presentation uh, four years ago as well. And sort of why I took upon this project and tried to bring it back, uh, it really came down to, I guess, three uh, main reasons. Number one, I really missed it. I think when it first came out, uh, I didn't see or, or come across any tools like it. It was sort of easy to use, um, had what I needed, and sort of uh, didn't have as much, much, enough features. Uh, we're sort of forced to explore, and I really like that, where you get to sort of uh, not be dictated for every single move, but sort of put the onus on you to try to learn more about it. Um, throughout the pandemic, I think specifically focusing on parks and green spaces and public spaces, uh, we saw sort of that need grow, or at least highlighted even more so in the last two years. So trying to think of a way to um, not really lose that focus, but highlight what was sort of uh, the state back then and how people still connect to those places is something that was always in my mind and trying to highlight visually um, how to express that. And then finally, um, just because of my interest in different topics, this project really sort of uh, naturally intersected those and also gave me an opportunity to uh, learn about different things, different communities, and just explore uh, my city, my home. So it was uh, really those three things that sort of keep pushing me to work on uh, it's nearby. Um, most people who know me, I think in about five, 10 minutes of talking, I'll bring up Scarborough for no apparent reason. So I had to put at least a slide uh, where the serve project focused on originally, uh, which is why it says was, uh, is Scarborough. Um, if you sort of listen to previous uh, election campaigns or just uh, different models of the past, um, Scarborough given its sort of uh, abundance of green spaces, almost every community that you can pinpoint has at least a park um, is really known for its green space. So when I was thinking about sort of the parks focus, um, I know just by myself, I couldn't really cover uh, the entire city. Um, and I, I think that uh, starting off at least some place that I'm familiar with uh, gave me a good uh, basis to start off with and grow, but uh, it came up, you know, pretty apparent that um, other areas of the city, not just Scarborough, but you know, Etobicoke, North York, et cetera, um, they all have their stories to show. So uh, while I did sort of focus on Scarborough and that's where my uh, personal focus is, I hope that this project can sort of um, uh, collaborate, collaborate with different areas across the city. Um, you may have heard this motto before, a city within a park. Some of the old park signs still sort of have that motto. And uh, just to show you this, map by uh, park people, you can see just the abundance of green spaces all over. So um, sort of each community, each park um, has its own story to tell. So I think that 
uh, focusing on parks and how it intertwines with communities, how it's used as meeting spaces for some, um, others as their, you know, soccer field and et cetera, um, really sort of gave me a focus of what to start off with and naturally figure out what different communities use us for and how it connects to other community spaces and things like that. Um, yeah, I think that that motto, city within the park, I wish the city served, uh, used it more because I think it really uh, encapsulates sort of the, the relationship between sort of our growing city and the, the green spaces that we still have. So it's nearby, before I get into, I guess, how old to sort of came up, it's actually a uh, three-part project. And the main uh, phase and focus has always been sort of bringing back that web map uh, with OTO. Uh, back when they sort of departed the city, they did leave the source code behind. So as I was sort of watching it sort of fade and try to bring it back on my own, um, I was really grateful that the code existed, but it also was sort of a lot of work from my end to sort of explore and figure out how to even work with this thing, how to bring it back up, test it, uh, read the data set. So there is a lot of a moving parts and still is a lot of moving parts uh, to it. So that was sort of, uh, if I were to group it up into different categories of priorities, phase one of, of that web map. Uh, the other part, which sort of uh, I thought about more with OTO and seeing other different projects sort of come up, uh, was trying to intertwine sort of the use of photos and sort of that digital realm and bring it sort of live to you, especially the part, because I think as great as sort of interacting with a web map uh, could be giving you a lot of information, not just through photo, but through threats, text. If you're in a park just on your screen the entire time, it sort of defeats the purpose of exploring that area. So I wanted to figure out what would be a, a cool but useful way to sort of bring at least some of that information into sort of your experience with a park. And um, AR, augmented reality, was sort of something that always sort of came up when I was trying to find out different solutions or uh, resources that others have used in summer projects. Um, so I'll sort of show a tidbit of um, how that's sort of in the works uh, using also an open source resource. And then finally, phase three, um, this is sort of tied to sort of the photography focus and trying to integrate not just archival photos, but current photos that sort of people take of parks and, and the living, I guess, document that people have uh, using photos, trying to integrate that into in-person activation. So something not really AR related, but sort of tied to a uh, public art installation, for example. And when I first sort of saw OTO, I, seeing that map was really cool because something that I used to do just on my own was see any photos nearby and actually go to that site and see and compare uh, in person, see what the differences are. Because for some of them, it's completely stark. Uh, and in other cases, it looks just like it was uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago. So trying to bring that sort of experience in like a our installation type was sort of a, an idea that I had with phase three. Um, and luckily, uh, we sort of had some uh, successes with sort of bringing that up in sort of new formats, which I'll uh, talk about in a bit. Regarding just AR, um, pretty sure everyone sort of knows what it is, but just as an example, if you ever use Instagram or uh, Snapchat apps to sort of face filters, uh, more so now with uh, IKEA and sort of like stores that sort of sell goods, uh, services. Um, they also use AR to sort of present um, their products that they sell and sort of visualize what it looks like in your setting. And sort of focusing with photos and OTO, um, a cool sort of way to use OTO was mainly to highlight the past and present changes. So uh, this idea is actually not new, it's using um, archival photos and augmented reality. You can find a lot of examples in sort of niche communities like the subreddit, old photos in real life. Uh, there's actually existing apps such as OnFoot, um, which for those who haven't heard of it, it sort of uh, uses AR or walking tour type of app uh, in sort of different pockets of downtown Toronto. Um, back when this sort of slide was made a, a couple of weeks ago, still found uh, more and more uh, examples that are just coming up. So it's still a growing space. Um, it's just really cool to see how different people um, are coming up with their solutions using IR for it. The other reason of sort of why I wanted to use OTO and as like a, a building base and not just build something from scratch was it had a really good resource, a really good uh, layout. But at the same time, even back when it was up and running, 
uh, I noticed a lot of gaps in basically uh, boroughs outside of the core. So if you were to look in like this screenshot in Scarborough or sort of on the west end in Tobago, um, you'll sort of see the same story where it looks sparse. Uh, but if you ask people who sort of live or grew up in those areas, it does actually have a rich history. There are sort of high couple images. Part of the reason why it was sort of left out um, back when sort of this was developed by Sabak Labs was if you sort of think about the history of Toronto, the boundaries back then were just the downtown core. So historically it has changed. So depending on how you parse data and how you define Toronto, um, that dictates where you see data points. But the lack thereof in certain areas, um, I think back when I was up, might have given certain people an idea that there wasn't any information or history there. So part of the reason why I really wanted to bring this back up was to highlight what was going around in my community and hopefully uh, apply that to other boroughs so that can share their stories as well. Um, with sort of the different apps that sort of example for uh, on foot, for example, um, they also focus sort of on the downtown course for this because of the same reason of sort of the historical Toronto boundaries. So even though there are current solutions available uh, for someone who lives outside of downtown, um, they may not see any use uh, in those apps because it doesn't really provide information relevant to their surroundings or their area. This was sort of the uh, concept idea of what an AR experience could sort of look like. Um, I think a lot of people might remember the Pokemon Go phrase. I think people still play that game. Um, but sort of thinking of that concept of imagine just going to a location, pulling up your phone, and then actually seeing sort of the photo placed relatively near to where it was taken. Um, this screenshot is actually using um, a real archival image of the park behind it. So that's actually uh, Moorish Park in the East End. Um, it's one of the smallest uh, parks sort of in that area. And it's, there's no sidewalks around it. It's surrounded by um, auto shops and uh, just a private residential property. So it's sort of weird why a park property would be there. But if you sort of explore and research the, the, the history behind it, it turns out it used to be home to one of the, the first ever fire halls in Scarborough. So as that firehouse decommissioned, even though um, it's no longer in use, uh, it still falls under the city's uh, land ownership. So they decided to sort of conserve that area as uh, keeping it as a park. So just by that one photo, I got to sort of learn um, why that park even exists in that sort of area, um, why it's sort of in that shape or a lack of sidewalks and things like that. And what's sort of cool is as sort of this project shows its past, um, what's the idea with sort of highlighting these parks is to figure out or show um, what current changes, if any, are occurring. And actually this past week, the city has uh, sort of closed up a survey um, because they're actually looking to redo this entire park and integrate with new development. So um, it's really cool to see both the past and present of it, but um, hopefully with this project and documenting different things that both the city and community resources can add, you can also sort of tell the story of what its future can look like. To sort of show different attempts, or at least uh, one attempt of trying to figure out this sort of AR aspect, uh, what you see on the left-hand side is just sort of a screen uh, recording of using an open source uh, library called ARJS. Um, for those who haven't used it um, and are maybe interested or just curious of AR, I highly recommend it. Um, it's really easy to use where they have a front end already developed and just through a GitHub site, um, you have two options to either upload your images and create a marker or a QR code where you can actually just use your phone um, and then actually have the image pop up. Or in sort of this example, um, tie certain number of images to GPS coordinates and then um, visit that location and actually see that image pop up. Uh, part of the reason why it's sort of jittery is as it's using your phone's GPS, uh, location services, depending on the quality and things like that, that sort of affects the experience, but uh, for something that's a free to use resource, uh, no hosting fees or things like that, um, it was really cool to just see uh, a concept idea of what you can sort of build off from using free and open source resources and then uh, maybe decide to sort of take it further. Uh, for those curious, sort of the image on the left that's uh, used as the AR image, uh, it's actually an image from the 60s of, uh, of old scout camp uh, members who are unveiling this plaque that was uh, uh, commemorating sort of the park's history. And this is uh, in Morningside Park over the East End. 
So when thinking about it's nearby and trying to figure out other than, you know, bring back this web map, bring back OTO, uh, what could it do or, or what could it really focus on? Um, I really wanted to have sort of goals to sort of focus on and sort of tackle and create tasks that way. So in terms of project goals, I sort of really narrowed it down to three main spaces. Number one, uh, sort of the, the, the thing that brought me sort of interest to OTO was the focus on spaces or public spaces in particular. Uh, trying to document and serve a similar way uh, green spaces across the city and also maybe other uh, public spaces that are used sort of in a similar way and, and might not be uh, outdoor or a green field. Uh, the other aspect was, of course, civic tech friendly. Um, if it wasn't made open source this way, uh, I wouldn't have been able to interact, build, or use something like this, at least on my own. So it was really important to me that as I sort of work on this, make updates, um, look through the data set, I also sort of continue that um, uh, practice of keeping it open source, keeping it civic tech friendly, so that if anyone else who's like me, curious in this project and bringing it back up, if they want to use it for their own purposes, modify for a different idea, they're able to. So to me, that was also something that was very important to make as a goal, to make it civic tech friendly. And then finally, uh, think about how people could use this. Um, just for fun is, is totally fine. I think that you don't have to be a history buff to sort of explore it. But at the same time, I think uh, for those who want to maybe take it beyond or try to see how it can use it as a tool, um, sort of using it as an educational or even a conservation type of tool, seeing how the city's changing and sort of green spaces, um, both within and outside the city are sort of changing or in some cases being lost, uh, is really important to me. And then making sure that uh, while it's still there, uh, we can fight to save it, or at the very least educate others of why it's important. So that education and, and conservation piece is hopefully something that I can grow more of uh, with this tool and, and encourage others to sort of explore that area as well. All right, so now sort of, I guess, to the, a bit of the tech side, um, specifically on how to actually bring back OTO. Um, this has been like quite a journey for me. I work as a data analyst, so I do have sort of, um, some of, uh, I guess, technical skills to sort of read the code and bring it back up. But there are a lot of things that I have never done um, at all. Uh, web development is completely new to me, uh, knowing how to, you know, bring up a backend server, things like that, lots of Googling. So what was really cool about this project is it taught me a lot of new skills, but also helped me hone some of the, the skills I use um, day to day. Uh, so with OTO, sort of the first step uh, was just to revisit what was there. So sort of look through uh, the existing GitHub, which I'll sort of show in a, in a minute, um, seeing the code, seeing not just the code and sort of documentation behind it, uh, which there was fortunately a lot of, but also looking at how it was released to the public, knowing sort of tidbits information that was maybe tied to it when it was introduced. So there was a lot of press releases back when this was um, announced, a lot of blog features that actually gave me information and context of how they gathered the information. Um, what I found sort of going through this process was, uh, even though a lot of the images were you know, sourced through uh, the City of Toronto Archives, after actually speaking with their staff, a lot of them didn't know this tool existed. So it was really uh, cool to know that a lot of this was sort of spun up by uh, Slavok Lab staff sort of on their own and um, trying to figure out different ways. Um, but at the same time, it also sort of brought up uh, new features or new sort of uh, uh, events to look at that uh, the city staff might wanted to know about or same thing with the a Toronto Public Library. Um, something that's also really cool is specific Voltio, if you go back to the civic, Civic Tech Toronto's YouTube channel, um, Civic Tech Hack Night 141 was actually uh, about this project and you can actually listen uh, to the uh, main developer of this tool of how he brought it up, uh, you know, different tidbits of what was interesting to him. Uh, for those who don't know, um, Dan actually is part of not just OTO development, but two other cities. So he's actually done this similar type of project for NYC with old NYC as well as uh, San Francisco, so old SF. So you can, I think both of those sites are still live, so you can also explore those if uh, those cities are of interest to you. Um, after going through sort of the code review, as well as you know how it was introduced and different tidbits from there, uh, it's about 
building it, bringing it back together. Um, this was quite challenging for me, uh, just because there's a lot of things that I just had no idea of. Uh, I remember looking back and like seeing yarn and like thinking like, what does that have to do with code and, and stuff like that? But uh, one thing was sort of, I guess, really cool was um, trying to figure that out with sort of the civic tech community. So you can sort of see that tweet of uh, just asking questions either, you know, through this community or just in public and just trying to figure out um, how to, you know, bring this up. And what was really cool about this was just seeing all the feedback, uh, which showed me that number one, uh, there's a lot of uh, kind and helpful people out there. And number two, there's a lot of interest uh, behind this. So it wasn't just me missing this tool, but others who are excited to sort of see this uh, come up again. Um, I haven't really figured out a way to sort of phrase this, but uh, something that someone else sort of showed me was this, I don't know if it's still a movement, but um, the hashtag build in public, it's, I've seen it used in startups a lot, but sort of what a lot of people do with this hashtag is build their product uh, to sort of the public and showing them how different features are coming up. So I think it's really cool that uh, in some cases it might be useful um, or beneficial to just release that final product and just have it ready for everyone to use. Uh, but in other cases, it's also interesting to see how a tool is being developed, how, you know, something might be released and seeing different features build up or community feedback. So to me, you know, I think the way I sort of worked on this project was sort of related to this build in public type of movement. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it would be really cool to see any other examples, either through civic tech or et cetera, but most of sort of the examples I saw was related to sort of startups. Um, from sort of that building stage and sort of once it was sort of up and running, um, the third step was assess and learn. So in addition to just reaching out to the civic tech community to sort of test it out and you know see what perks and things uh, are there, um, it was also learning a lot of different things. As I mentioned, sort of web development to host this uh, data set and website and front end. Um, well, I was really fortunate enough to also come across different types of solutions. So low code, for example, where um, to build up sort of a, a quick site just so I can sort of post updates and things like that. Um, I wanted to make sure that I can focus as much time to the development. So I was sort of introduced to sort of low code solutions where uh, in short to sort of build certain type of digital products or tools. Um, there are um, different methods available where you yourself don't need to code it or at least the base of um, and, and use, you know, uh, features such as building a website with drag and drop or uh, building a web app where you sort of uh, connect to different sheets or databases, but not code the front end yourself, at least not completely. So that sort of relates to low code if you haven't heard of it. And um, for those who are maybe interested in bringing up these projects, but not, not feel um, as confident in your technical skills, um, I, I think low code is uh, a really cool and growing space to explore. And from there, I think um, especially if you compare it to uh, programming experiences, it, I think uh, it works well together. And then finally, uh, in sort of that learning stage, with everything that was sort of up and running, I also get to sort of see firsthand what areas might be lacking, what areas might not be working as, as I thought or intended it would be. So it really wasn't just learning what was there, but also giving me an opportunity to um, explore areas of improvements, uh, document a lot of things, document a lot of bugs, but also uh, think about different data sets or at least uh, some other feature to maybe explore to connect to that future day. Um, and then finally, uh, step four is really just saying, do step three in a loop. Um, it, it's never gonna uh, sort of be complete or finished. I think that uh, projects like this, it's really cool to just learn more and more and more of. Um, so as I sort of focus on the goals and what to try to complete, I also, try to think what else could be done, small changes or big changes, and sort of go back and learn. I think that to me makes this project and this work fun um, and, and not tedious and boring because I get to just continually grow from it. So before I get to sort of the site, uh, for those who are just maybe interested in sort of how this data set works, at least with the photos, um, it's mainly sort of served in a GeoJSON format. Uh, for those who aren't sort of familiar with it, just imagine a giant list of different um, objects, or in this case, photographs. And every single photo um, has its own metadata or field that ex explain what it is and how it's unique to other photos. Um, this is a lot to read, and this is just to show you what 
one image uh, uh, looks like in terms of all the different fields and information provides. This data set currently has uh, just a little over 37,000 photos and it was last updated in 2018. Uh, so there's even more photos that the City of Toronto and the Public uh, Library Archives have released, so uh, it'll definitely grow. Um, and just to sort of parse through this and just show you how this relates to mapping it out, um, some of the fields that you'll see is an ID, which makes it unique. So you know um, how to sort of separate one photo from another, especially if that's the same location. Um, there's coordinates available, so you can actually pinpoint uh, where the images are. This was sort of done using the title of the images. What was really common in a lot of archival images was that the title was a description of, of its location. So in this case, you can see corner of Center Street and Armory Street looking south. And if you sort of put it through a geocoder, um, in Sato Labs case, because they're part of Google, they use Google Maps um, API, they were able to generate from that title, that coordinate, and they were able to apply that uh, to basically all the images, and that's how they were able to map a photo to a spot on a map. Um, there's also fields that are from the archive that give you descriptions of what you're looking at, where the image came from, when it was taken. So in this case, you can see uh, in this particular example, um, the date is from 1972. Uh, sort of the image or information about the photo is at least um, this sort of source uh, came from a, a black and white photograph from a 30, uh, 35 millimeter photograph, so it's film. Um, and there's also a URL available because sort of when you use this map, you wanna see the image. Um, and rather than hosting and downloading all these images, since it's being hosted elsewhere, you're able to just directly link it uh, to its original source. And especially with um, archival information, uh, a lot of people who are interested in this photo want to see and know about the source. So it's really important to sort of credit where it's from. And I will actually quickly jump to sort of a live version that is up. So I'll share my screen. Um, yeah, so going to this map, um, I'm curious to see what is around our current location. So let's maybe zoom in to sort of our uh, approximate location here in person. Uh, I can see sort of the Sedina Crescent, so I know I'm nearby. Um, I could use sort of the, the search bar, but I'm afraid it might break and live demos uh, are not really that great. So I'll do my best to sort of navigating where we are. And I'm pretty sure uh, the My Hall Center is pretty close to the physical geography building. So I, I'm gonna say um, we're right around this space right here. and. Just like, uh, just looking around, I can see um, images sort of close to Convocation Hall, um, Anthropology Building, and I'm curious to see sort of this corner right here, St. George um, and Galbraith Road. So while I click on it, uh, what you'll see is sort of a pop-up of any images that are tied to that coordinate. And sort of what you can see here is a plus two icon that shows that there's additional images at this location. Um, I can quickly click on one, and it sort of brings up this image gallery of what is available at this spot. Um, part of what you see here is geocoded from the title and you can see a pretty clear or, or clear enough sort of street location. Um, and if I sort of look around, uh, I do you know, recognize convocation call here as well as the building on the side. Uh, so it's pretty close to actually where we are. I think it's actually accurate. And actually sort of what you can see here is the information or the metadata of where this image came from, how old it is, um, as well as sort of its citation so that you can actually go back and visit. So this was sort of done um, for every single image that you can see here. If you can sort of imagine what happens if the title is wrong, what if it's mislabeled? Well, you also see those errors as well. And I think um, when this sort of map starts up, I think what was really sort of interesting when I was able to bring this back up was that I just accidentally decided to zoom outside the city um, and then sort of looked if there's anything maybe outside of Toronto, even though all these images are supposedly from the archives. And you can actually see points um, all the way near uh, Windsor. So you can see in some cases it's not as accurate. Part of the reason why this can happen is in certain cities, they share the same road names, such as King Street. There's many of them in Ontario. 
Um, the building name might be common in different cities. So the just using the, the title uh, to geocode isn't uh, always accurate, but you can see for a, a bulk of these images, um, it was enough information to get it at least at approximate um, location. Uh, what would be really cool to sort of add on as a, a, a different button, um, and I'm trying to explore different ways to sort of integrate this, is a way that people can sort of report um, and even provide a suggestion of where the image should be. So something that I want to do and maybe not make it uh, tied to the website because as slow as the web development could be, it sort of slow down that access, was looking at different resources or different tools I can do to sort of showcase something similar, but give people that feature to edit or annotate um, an image. So one really cool I came across just working on this uh, project was another online uh, mapping tool called Felt. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Felt, just imagine Google Docs, but for maps. So you're able to share, edit, uh, make sticky notes, emojis, you name it, you can add it in. Um, and it's really cool, it's just super easy to use, it's free. Um, and then with this link, I can actually sort of share it out. There is a requirement that for those who want to make that edit, you do have to sign in with a, a felt account. But from here, um, sort of if I go back to that image that I uh, sort of saw um, outside of the city boundaries, uh, what someone can do is simply highlight the image if they were sort of signed in, see sort of the information behind it. So not just the photo, but just what is actually sort of feeding behind it. And then ideally make an edit. Uh, so sort of have like a live data set that people can edit. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of caveats and things with that, but I think it would be really cool to try to see what this data set could look like and make it more open, not just for access, but to actually improve its accuracy. So I'm just going to go back to the presentation. So for anyone else sort of curious on just more of the code and things like that, um, it's all live on GitHub and I'll sort of share a link at the end. But something that was sort of uh, really interesting was that when I sort of looked at it's nearby and, and focusing on that web map, I thought that would be my main focus, that it would be, you know, the, that primary goal that sort of people look at and think it's nearby, the web map. But what was sort of interesting is I was working on this project, a lot more opportunities came in sort of the other phases that I talked about, the AR and specifically phase three, that in-person installation. Um, through sort of photography and talking to uh, city staff from the archives or the public library, um, I met a lot of other people interested in photos and particularly uh, using photos in sort of community engagement and public art installations. So throughout sort of the two, three years I've sort of looked and played around with this, I sort of inadvertently got sort of uh, involved in the public art space and was really able to sort of think about what it's nearby can be in an in-person type of setup. So what you can actually see here is uh, public art installation that I was able to lead last summer um, with partnership with the City of Toronto, um, their Culture Hotspots project. And uh, what was sort of done in this project was basically create a uh, outdoor pop-up photo gallery. And what we sort of did was work with uh, local youth, I'm trying to go to the next step there, work with local youth in this neighborhood, um, it's called the Goal Mile and uh, work with them on teaching them public art installation skills, learning how to go through the permitting process, how to curate your installation. Um, and the images you can see here is actually a mix of photos that they took uh, to sort of showcase their community of uh, what it means to them, as well as images from the archives of that surrounding location. Um, and it was supposed to take about an hour to sort of set up, but we actually ended up going over two hours because every time we put a photo, we were stopped by just members of the public pointing out um, an old dealership that they bought their car at or the old college building that they used to go to. So it was really cool to just bring that uh, web map type of uh, uh, feature to serve an in-person type of view uh, and to work with like the community themselves to sort of um, have them celebrate uh, their space and, and use photography in it. So uh, it was really cool to sort of bring that idea to life and um, from this uh, sort of project, I've been involved in um, at least two other public art installations in the same year, so it's been great. 
um, sort of focusing on just parks as well and learning more about parks. I was able to also be a part of uh, the City of Toronto and Parks People's joint initiative called Into the Ravines Champion, Community Champions Program. Um, the city has this really weird obsession of writing like TO to everything. So uh, this is one of those examples. Um, but with sort of into this into, into the Ravines uh, program, um, they sort of mentor uh, different local champions to highlight the different ravines uh, systems that sort of make up the city. And I was very fortunate enough to sort of uh, work with a friend of mine to highlight uh, a local ravine in our area, the Holland Creek Ravine, uh, which connects to actually Morningside Park from the images in the past, uh, and then sort of represents uh, that ravine and share information with others. Uh, Parks people actually mentors us in different ways of not just talking about sort of the natural features of ravine, but explain sort of uh, indigenous history tied to it, um, conservation education, which sort of ties sort of the goals I had with this project. So as I was sort of focusing on uh, what I can build up with it's nearby, I also want to sort of be a part of um, opportunities that can um, help me uh, be sort of a more knowledgeable person of the areas I want to highlight. Um, and just as sort of an FYI, um, being a part of this project uh, was, was really great. The city actually gives you resources to run your own events. So sort of what we were able to do at the end of this project was run a photo walk event where we gave away um, hundreds of dollars of hiking gear. You can sort of see the group in the, the, the back that basically every single person uh, won at least a prize. So it was really cool to just uh, work with the community to highlight uh, different park spaces and have them involved sort of in this photography type of way. And as an FYI, for anyone who is interested in this type of uh, activity, um, the next or this year's call out is happening right now or at least soon. So for those interested, um, search up into the ravines or talk to me. Uh, finally, uh, just to sort of wrap up these different type of community opportunities, um, I recently had the opportunity to partner up with Vibe Arts, a uh, local creative arts organization in Scotiabank. Um, to actually create a project around documenting public spaces. So this is now sort of getting a, a little away from parks, but sort of focusing on how different spaces and publics are being used and try to highlight in this case, um, the decommissioning of the RT. Um, so for those who use the subway, if you ever look on the map, you see just a tiny blue line. Um, that is, I guess, an, an LRT uh, sort of in the East End. And after 35 years, it's actually being decommissioned. It's 10 years past its lifespan. Um, in some cases, it's literally being held by duct tape, uh, according to the Toronto Star investigation. So it, it's going to be uh, pretty rough to see it go and have it being replaced by shuttle buses for at least seven years until the, the subway uh, extension is being built. So while that's sort of happening, um, I thought it would be sort of, you know, really cool to at least document its current sort of state, how it sort of integrates with different community stops and work with the community just like the Gold Miles Project to document um, the RT and its surroundings. Um, and hopefully with these uh, images, we get to document um, how the area has changed or in some cases erased. Um, and just to sort of highlight the interest, it's just a couple of days of just releasing this the sort of application call out ended um, last Friday. We had over 80 applications, uh, just so people interested and wanted to be part of it. Um, sort of just highlight what this sort of project sort of grew into out of the photography. It's sort of teaching people the same skills that I learned a bit more about how to sort of use open source resources on uh, building your own map. So building a GIS skill, uh, looking into augmented reality and just having an, an intro to it. So, you know, um, how to maybe work with the ideas that you had and sort of put into practice as well as tying in transit advocacy. So not just sort of focusing on a project to highlight community, but also trying to think of ways to sort of help uh, people be more informed and, and serve them and the, their surrounding areas. So this project really sort of uh, start off as sort of photo based, but using those same goals, trying to bring it back and share the skills I've learned through this project to others and sort of uh, hopefully have that uh, ripple effect that more people are knowledgeable of these skills and can use it for other areas of their interests. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more, at least following along on this project, you'd also can visit that link at the bottom. It's nearby.ca slash RT. Um, and I know it's uh, getting a bit close to time, but just to sort of wrap up, on lessons learned, um, this project and just trying to build this up to what it can be and, and integrating different things um, grew a lot bigger than I anticipated. So it's really important to sort of balance the load and uh, you know uh, as many ideas as you can think of and trying to reach them. Um, 
it, it's also really good, especially if you want to be, you know, part of a sustainable project to sort of leverage and look at what's already existing, existing resources, as well as an existing community, people who have sort of the skills and interests to sort of help you or at least partner up. Um, working on your own, uh, from what I learned, can uh, teach you a lot, but can also cost you a lot. It costs a lot of time, uh, a lot of energy, and uh, using the Google Maps API, a lot of money. So uh, in terms of, you know, focusing on community projects, if that's your interest, uh, what I really like to do is sort of uh, focus on community projects as, uh, I guess, the mantra, by the community, for the community. So if you have a, a certain place or an area that you want to highlight, see if it's uh, sort of worth it to at least engage and learn more about the community and, and have those steps implemented in. Uh, from what I learned, especially with uh, documenting spaces that uh, people are really personally invested and tied to, uh, not every story is yours to tell. So I think for me, uh, it was really important to know when to provide those opportunities for others to share their stories uh, if I'm not the best person to do that. And then sort of into the, the technical side, um, just open source resources and that support. Um, all of this would not have been available if Sidewalk Labs didn't make that decision to make it open source, at least uh, the way that it was sort of built up and explored. So it's really important to me that I sort of continue that cycle because for me, it was a low, it was decreasing the barriers to access to um, that type of information, uh, that type of sort of project. And I think Continuing that would lower the barrier of access to current and, and future civic tech enthusiasts. Um, and then finally, um, without all their documentation, I would have been even more lost. So it's really important that if you do take on these open source projects to try your best to document um, as, as best as you can. And then finally, um, really just for any type of project that you're able to uh, Try to find ways to be flexible where your original idea, it might grow away from it, it might integrate with something else. Um, that's not always a bad thing. I think it's important to have project goals and sort of have targets to meet. But at the same time, uh, being flexible for me, uh, focusing on a digital map led to public art projects, which I would have never thought of two years ago. So uh, to me, being flexible mm -hmm. grew so many different opportunities for myself and other people. Um, and then at the very end, just simply being more flexible to me meant more fun. So working on projects, especially if it takes weeks, months, years, uh, you're gonna wanna have some fun times. So I think that having at least a thought or a way to plan that out, um, either formally or informally, is really important to just for your energy and for others if it's a, a multi-team project. Um, sort of what's next. Number one, updating the website. Uh, Google Maps is really expensive. I want to save my wallet and my money. So I'm trying to figure out different plays and platforms to sort of move away from it. Um, the other thing I sort of learned was sort of how Sidewalk Labs built this website uh, on their own was great, but it also meant there was sort of copyright rules, especially aerial photos that they actually um, sort of ignored. So trying to be a little more uh, focused and intentional on how to obtain the data the right way um, is also something that I want to do when updating that website. Um, the data set, uh, for those who follow, the Toronto Archives on Twitter just recently announced they added uh, 17,000 more photos to their uh, uh, archives. Uh, and one particular uh, collection of photos, the Harvard Wool Laver Fonds, um, has almost 700 photos of just the city, across the city, um, taken in like the 80s and 90s range. So that's one of the data sets that I'll be looking at to geocode. And if anyone's sort of interested in exploring those photos and sort of helping out map out, um, that's sort of the next uh, project and task up. And then finally, just not just focusing on archival information, but allowing other people to maybe share their stories, especially if areas are you know, new developments, new communities that don't have previous stories to tell. I want to sort of have an, a way that people can submit or comment or add sort of their comments and photos to this. So exploring public submissions or a way to integrate that would be another way to expand this project. And then finally, with community collaborations, um, it's been amazing to just uh, integrate this idea in a creative arts way with different communities uh, and I want to sort of continue that so uh, for me personally working with different community organizations like Five Arts um, really helps sort of grow the product in new ways and have other people interested in these topics or develop new interests from these projects so that's another um, area that uh, I definitely want to sort of focus on and would love to collaborate with anyone else um, who has sort of this shared interest. <laughs> That's it for me. I did a lot of talking, but hopefully learned at least uh, something new. Uh, if you're interested in just learning more about the project, uh, following along, or just reaching out with me, 
Um, those are sort of the links to the project and myself. Um, happy to take any questions either now or in the breakout room, but I'll pass it over. Thank you.